This is Lunchtime Agenda. Hello, welcome to Lunchtime Agenda for this Easter Monday. I'm Tom Connell. And today, of course, plenty of discussion and tributes pouring in for Neville Rann, the Premier of New South Wales from 1976 until 1986. It wasn't always a government without controversy, but Neville Rann managed to ride some of those rough seas and retired still at the top of his game, very much to the surprise of people at the time. We've had, as I said, several, several tributes, including from the Leader of the Opposition, Bill Shorten. Few are made as tough, as smart, as honourable as Neville Rann. After 1975, the Rand slide elections helped rebuild Labor's fortunes in New South Wales and indeed nationally. It was Neville Rann who kept the light on the hill burning brightly for Labor. Prime Minister Tony Abbott has today released a statement on the death of Neville Rann, again praising him, talking about his 10 years in office, uh, also talking about what he believes uh, some of his key achievements as Premier were, and they include the development of or redevelopment of Darling Harbour and building the Sydney Entertainment Centre. Well, for more on this and the rest of the day's political debates and topics, I'm joined in our Sky News Centre by Labor Senator Deborah O'Neill and also Andrew Lamming, Government MP, of course, up in our Brisbane studio. Thanks both for joining us today. Hi, Tom. How Great are you? Great to be with you. Hello, Andrew. I might start with a little bit on uh, Neville Rand. Deb O'Neill certainly left a, la a lasting legacy in New South Wales, perhaps even more so because, as mentioned, he really did go out on his own terms, didn't he? Well, well he did, and I think that the, the terms that you just heard from Bill Shorten there are ones that you know, I'd want to echo as a New South Welsh woman. Um, he certainly was tough and made difficult decisions in the Labor tradition, you know, with a testimony of... Uh, things now that reveal what we believed in. Uh, so he was certainly a tough man making those great decisions for the public interest, but also a man who uh, was really smart and very honourable in the way that he enacted that vision for Labor. And we see it in all of the, the, the things that have been highlighted here today, the investment in public infrastructure at Darling Harbour. But perhaps the thing for me is, uh, as a, a woman from Western Sydney who was just starting my studies at the time uh, that Neville was the Premier, there was no such thing as the University of Western Sydney until Neville Rand made it so. And that has absolutely transformed the lives of ordinary Australians out in the west of Sydney and uh, in the most powerful way. You know, uh, the boy from Balmain who got a great education himself, who made the best of the education opportunities that were given to him and then chose to enter into public service and give his life to you know, millions of us really across this state. And I, I think it's also a, a very important time right now to acknowledge the generosity of his family in sharing him with us so much over his entire political career, but particularly uh, under that time of pressure as the, pro as the Premier of New South Wales. And once again, uh, that generosity in, in accepting a state funeral and allowing so many of us to be able to pay our respects to a man who, who led exactly as, as Bill Shorten has described, smart, honourable with uh, great courage. Andrew Lamming, uh, I'll let you add your own thoughts, but also a question. Neville Rann obviously also wrote out some controversy during his time as Premier, including a Royal Commission that eventually cleared him of any wrongdoing after allegations of improper influence in a court case. Uh, I'm interested perhaps in your thoughts on the modern media cycle. Is that the reason Barry O'Farrell couldn't write out some of his own controversy last week? Look, Tom, certainly controversy will continue to follow politics as long as there is politics. Uh, what's important is that Neville Rand may well have transformed the lives of New South Welshmen in the 70s, but um, what's notable is how little the Labor Party has changed ever since. It hasn't moved with the times. Uh, it hasn't had uh, anyone of Neville Rand's uh, stature uh, really, really change the way the party operates. That's why they find themselves in the predicament that they are in today. Uh, Labor is completely disconnected from some of the really big issues facing Australia. Uh, Long-term unemployment, no welfare reform of note in the last six years, and obviously still wedded to the carbon tax and the mining tax. Perhaps someone like Neville Rand might have seen that coming, but at the moment I don't think the current la Labor leadership has. Oh, I, th I think that's a bit of a cheap shot, you know. In reality, today is a day to hail the uh, 
generous service of the nation through his premiership. And uh, you know, other Liberal members, uh, including the Prime Minister, have been able to make comment that's positive in light of uh, the legacy that Rand leaves. And I think it's very small-minded to go to that sort of uh, issue so quickly when we're talking about a great leader. You know, if you want to talk about ICAC, let's talk about that in a different uh, a different zone and have a conversation about the fact that it's uh, the Liberal Premier who had to resign and Sinadina is still to present, Harcher, Weber and Spence still coming. That, let's talk about that separately but don't try and tarnish the, uh, the fine reputation of a fine Premier of New South Wales. All right, well uh, we might uh, move on and talk a little bit about of course a few stories to do with the budget today. Uh, I might ask you Andrew Lamming exactly what you think uh, the promise Tony Abbott made on the eve of the election was. You spoke about a no carbon tax there. We heard Tony Abbott say no changes to the pension right on the eve of the election. I think there's a fairly solid argument to talk about an increase to the pension age won't go in, won't be in place anytime soon, so perhaps that's one they're taking to voters. But what else is covered by this promise? Is it presumably covering any change to indexation, any change to eligibility? Would changing those before the next election be breaking that election promise? Well, I guess we're working ourselves into the uh, now very uh, mandatory uh, regular pre-budget lather. Um, let's be honest here, uh, the Liberal Party didn't wake up um, in uh, late last year and say, how tough can we make a first budget? We inherited a disaster and a mess. I mean, we inherited $123 billion of accumulated deficits, $661 billion uh, gross debt projected. I mean, these are massive numbers and it won't be easy. Everyone heard the Prime Minister's promise, but if you're hanging out in shopping centres, I know there's a new Senator, uh, Deb, you don't have to anymore, but if you're actually hanging out with, uh, with voters, what you'll find is that they're, um, they're, they're seeing a Liberal Party that's absolutely committed to meeting their election commitments and that's what we'll do. We can make all the speculation that we wish to fill the news between now and mid-May but in but, the end but Andrew Lamming, uh, Tony it's a very is committed it's a very specific to delivering question. on what he said. Andrew Lamming, just to jump in, it's a very specific question because you're talking about speculation. We have that, that uh, ironclad pledge at seemingly no changes to the pension. You've spoken again about the budget situation. Is that softening up for perhaps some sort of change, as I said, specifically the indexation or eligibility of pensions? If they are changed in this budget or budgets before the election, would that be a breaking of that promise? Look, and you won't draw me into this kind of fruitless speculation that simply it's adds confusion answer, to the next Andrew. two months. It, it, what we're going to see yes is a budget no. brought down in May. It'll be the first budget. It, of course, everyone will have to, um, you know, pull their weight. I mean, we didn't inherit a balanced budget. This is a Labor Party that started with a surplus and ended with a massive deficit. And it's a little bit like uh, leaving a great big mess after an all-night party and then standing around as other people clean it up, having the Labor Party nitpicking about whether it goes in the recycling bin or, or not. I mean, this is ridiculous. So, and, it's going to be okay, tough. so it Andrew Lamming is perhaps balancing the budget is a commitment for this government. Is your talk about balancing the budget then the core promise and the non-core promise perhaps not changing pensions in any way? They're all promises, and I know that this is a prime minister who keeps them. Oh. So there's no core or non-core here, Andrew Lamming. Uh, not that I've heard of. Have you? Well, no, I'm asking you. I thought uh, there was quite an emphasis there on balancing the budget against talk about uh, pension changes. Well, of course, and this is the tough role that every government in, in the OECD faces. I mean, you try to meet your social obligations, you try to make sure uh, that you can pay the $10 billion every year that is basically paying off Labor debt. I mean, that comes at a significant opportunity cost, make no mistake. And we're faced with significant infrastructure requirements and a Prime Minister that's committed to delivering on elements like the Sydney, Second Sydney Airport and major road infrastructure in our major capitals. So that doesn't come cheap. There's going to be, have, there's going to be hard decisions, but that's one for the Treasury. There's no point speculating on individual right. issues okay. because, after all, it's only the Treasurer who knows the answer. OK, and we'll find out that answer, I suppose, pretty soon. Deb O'Neill, a lot of Labor's focus when they're asked about any of these cuts is the fact that the Abbott government is sticking to its paid parental leave scheme. Now, a lot of your colleagues have described this as a paid parental leave scheme for millionaires, but let's look at who else it would benefit. Theoretically, it could benefit a millionaire, but 1.7% of women actually make up the group earning more than even $100,000, hardly a millionaire's salary. When you've got the average salary for women at $60,000, they would actually benefit markedly from this paid parental leave scheme. They'd get about double the minimum wage over 26 weeks versus 18 weeks the original minimum wage under Labor's scheme. Now they were the first one to bring in a paid parental leave scheme but are you being dishonest not saying also that very much average voters, average wage earners would also benefit from this scheme? 
Well, look, look, I think that that's a nice argument, but um, in those shopping centres that Andrew seems to think, <coughs> excuse me, that I don't go to anymore, I'm meeting with pensioners who are hearing that this, this uh, Prime Minister, who promised them on the day before the election that there would be no changes to pensions, are actually saying that they're going to pay $75,000 to women to have children now, and they're going to take money away from pensioners and change conditions for pensions. Now, this is where these twisted priorities of this Prime Minister, who's got this commission of cuts, 900 pages apparently we hear, none of it seeing the light of day, this secret commission of cuts. Um, I think that the argument that you put, Tom, is, uh, is one that the Liberal Party are going to run with, but the reality is they're running away from responsibilities to ordinary people, pensioners who are on fixed incomes, who took Tony Abbott at his word, now I think that that was a bad decision on their part, but took him at his word that he would not cut pensions, that he would not change the pensions. That's what they're expecting. He won't rule it out. We've heard sort of all that obfuscation from uh, um, Andrew about well, commitments, non-core commitments, the ones that they will rule in, the ones they won't rule out. They're saying they're not going to rule anything in and out, but we constantly hear this Prime Minister standing up and saying, I will give $75,000 to women to have children, but... Right, but I that, might cut your focus, pensions, I might put a GP focus, tax right, on, I might do hospital taxes. That focus right there, taxes. Deb O'Neill. I'm sure there'll be plenty of talk about uh, the pension debate if there is a change. We've heard that pledge, but Labor's focus to talk about how this is paying $75,000 for, for women to have a baby or people to have a baby, that's going to be a very rare, rare circumstance, is it not? And the millionaire's comment, I mean, what proportion of people is that going to apply for, this millionaires having a baby thing? It must be 0, 0.0 something. Oh, look, the reality is, a a as a woman who had three children during my working life, you know, support from a government to make sure that there's a minimum of support for those families is, is vital. And that's what we achieved under a Labor government. There was not such a thing. In the last fort parliament, the 43rd parliament, we actually created a paid parental leave scheme where children who were born to ordinary working families of any... Um, uh, um, income level are going to get support with having those children. A paid parental leave to support mums and dads and bubs together, every Australian getting a fair share of that. What we're talking about here with Tony Abbott is money for the very, very wealthy and the wealthier you are, the more you get. Now, any pensioner that I've spoken to at Erin Affair or anywhere else on the Central Coast where I live, or indeed as I move around the state of New South Wales, cannot be sold, cannot accept that it's better to take money from them, take money away from pensioners, put taxes on going to the GP, put taxes on going to hospital, cut the NDIS, delay the NDIS. None of them can believe that those choices are the choices that Tony Abbott is ready to make to take money okay. away from them and give $75,000 to one woman for one child. There is okay, a massive we're going inequity to have to, we're going there. We're going to have to take a quick break. Uh, stay with us on Lunchtime Agenda. More after the break. A few other topics, including talk about high-speed rail again. It's Anzac Day this Friday, and if you're thinking of heading out to a dawn service, we thought we'd take a look at the weather for you in terms of the minimum temperatures that will be around. So it's going to be a chilly one if you're heading out in Hobart. Minimum of 6 degrees. Canberra 7, we will see a few showers around. Sydney, a little warmer though, still 17 degrees for you in Brisbane as well. We will be seeing a few showers, but it's going to be a dry one for you in Perth. Sunny skies, although your minimum is 12 degrees. Across New Zealand, a lot cooler down on the South Island, Dunedin at 7 degrees. Volvo is proudly partnered with Sky News to bring you Paul Murray Live, where we don't just tell you what happened today, we tell you what really happened today. Come and test drive the Volvo S60 and see why we're taking it V8 supercar racing. We all want our Queensland economy to grow stronger. And to prepare for growth, we're rolling out big plans for education, health and infrastructure right across the state. But to turn these plans into reality, we first have to deal with the accumulated debt of the past 10 years. An $80 billion debt with an interest bill of $4 billion every year. $4 billion could build 25 new schools, rebuild a regional hospital and build hundreds of kilometres of highway. To fix Queensland's debt and interest problems, strong choices have to be made. We can increase taxes, reduce services or we can sell or lease some assets. 
The choices we all make today have a critical impact on the future funding of vital projects right across the state. To help you join the conversation, the Queensland Government has launched this interactive website so you can find out more and have your say. Just visit strongchoices.qld.gov.au Authorised by the Queensland Government, Brisbane. I am not a morning person. There's a bit to do. Do my buttons, do my shoelaces. And your hair. Mum says breakfast is important. And that oats fill my tummy. Quick sachets are the same as Uncle Toby's oats. Just cut up small so they cook faster. Done in 90 seconds. Which means we can get you to school on time. Right. And they're nourishing, right? Real oats, real quick. Delicious. And of course, there's no artificial colours or flavours. Here are some smart ideas from Harpic. For a perfectly clean toilet, nothing beats Harpic White and Shine. Its scientific formula with baking soda and the power of bleach delivers unbeatable clean and dazzling shine. And to keep your toilet fresh between cleans, use Harpic Hygienic Plus. The cageless block has better coverage and a continuous fresh scent that lasts. Harpic White and Shine and Hygienic Plus. Smart ideas for you. Here at Sky News, I just call it how I see it. Just unfathomable. Banging on about this. You give away all the smoke and mirrors in television. But really, to know what really happened today, we've siphoned through all that for you. With a bit of opinion thrown in, maybe it's your opinion. Fair dinkum. Maybe not. PBO News Hour. Welcome back to Lunchtime Agenda. Good to have you with us on this Easter Monday and discussing the day's political issues and debates. We have Labor Senator Deborah O'Neill. She is in our Sky News Centre and also representing the Liberal National Party and, of course, the great state of Queensland, Andrew Lamming, who's up in our Brisbane studio. I might move on to a bit of a push we've seen over the last week, and that's a, a possibly a federal ICAC, some sort of federal body to look into corruption. Uh, Deb O'Neill, uh, this is gaining some momentum. We've heard more thoughts today from Nick Xenophon on this. What's your thoughts on it? Well, I, I think uh, integrity in public office is obviously the, the most central thing that has to be guaranteed in our political system. And I, uh, I think that we've seen a very interesting article just today from uh, Paul Sheehan in the Sydney Morning Herald um, entitled Bottle of Wine Revealed Liberal Party Was Under the Influence. And this whole sense of um, entitlement that we've seen revealed uh, and, and the relationships that are happening at New South Wales uh, level in the Liberal Party, and uh, much more of which is to come, is really crystallising people's minds in New South Wales about this issue of probity in public life. Um, I'd be very interested to see... You don't think all the see... uh, Labor issues and Eddie O'Bead crystallised a few minds as well? Oh, oh absolutely. I, I think that what, what's happened here, though, is that some reality has probably sadly come in to, to reveal to uh, New South Wales uh, men and women that... Uh, people who do the wrong thing can infiltrate any party and that we need to be on our guard against that. And indeed, we have to be extremely cautious in making sure that the people who seek public office are people of the type of quality that we've uh, been discussing with the former Premier Neville Rand's passing today. Somebody who's Andrew genuinely Lamming, there to serve the public, not themselves. Andrew Lamming, a few on your side have been a bit concerned that uh, the actual people found corrupt uh, at ICAC haven't yet suffered any real consequences and yet we've seen Barry O'Farrell uh, lose his position or step down as Premier. Your thoughts on maybe a federal ICAC? Well certainly ICAC is an investigative process, not necessarily a court finding guilt. Uh, I support Deborah's words about remaining constantly vigilant about uh, potential corruption and the uh, very, very fine line between patronage and undue influence. I think overall the point needs to be made that the federal government, until recently, hasn't been involved in many of the planning and infrastructure decisions that tends to attract uh, this sort of investment and interest. Uh, as the federal government does start uh, involving itself more in major projects, this becomes a greater risk. But at this present time, I think we have a reasonable uh, process running at the moment of transparency. I haven't seen the evidence to suggest that we need a federal ICAC yet. Uh, so I would be supporting the status quo at this point. And I think the overwhelming majority of people operating in, in federal parliament in Canberra uh, are doing a great job and aren't uh, you know, under undue influence from, from lobbyists. Tom, can I just 
say. Okay, I might move on quickly. Tom, to, to, sorry, I'm going to move on to, to the high-speed well, rail issue. It's something that's been raised by the Shadow Infrastructure Minister, Anthony Albanese. He's saying, uh, Deborah O'Neill, that this needs to be something that the government continues with in terms of Labor, where Labor left off with it. But uh, if you look at what Labor did in six years, there was a study, an election pledge for $52 million to essentially get it started. Uh, it's a $114 billion project though, almost no progress over six years. It was hardly a priority for Labor, was it? Look, the reality of building big things for our country is something that I think appeals to every Australian. You know, when I look at the Harbour Bridge and you get a sense of the vision that was held for the country um, when that was built, uh, Australians do respond to that and that sense of it, big vision for the country is vital. And that's why it's important that the work that we did in terms of securing uh, a, a proper uh, just and organised process as we move forward to ensure that the very fast train is possible and that, and that we have realistic numbers about what it would cost in terms of an investment for the country is important work that the Labor government did, um, certainly in a bipartisan way. Just but, didn't, as I, but didn't really push the issue hard, did it? Well, it, it pushed it hard enough that it was uh, something that I think captured the imagination of Australians and I think it's incumbent on this government to press forward with it. But I have to say I do have concern, some concerns that what we see in terms of uh, public transport investment by this uh, federal prime minister is, is zero. Basically, if it's got the word public in front of it, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. So. Right, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, captured imagination, I, I'm not sure, I mean, it was... I think the end date of 2050 made a lot of people pretty sceptical. Andrew Lamming, 52 million in the budget is in there. Should it be scrapped by the coalition? Uh, and if so, should there at least be a, this corridor quarantine? We know how difficult it is to build things once there are houses in, in the way. Uh, knowing little about the proposed high-speed rail, I'd support uh, reservation of a corridor. This seems like common sense, but certainly the high-speed rail is not yet economically stacking up. I come from a decentralised state like Queensland where people just want to be able to get to work on time, and I think we're far more focused on areas that the Abbott government is investing in, uh, the major road infrastructure for our cities to reduce congestion. That's really where the focus is in the short to medium term. I'm happy to look at that, economics that, that will show me a high-speed rail is cost-effective. I don't see it at the moment. That focus you spoke about, we know what won't be in the budget, of course, and that's money for uh, public metro rail. Funding for public transport in cities is really a distinction that the Abbott government's made, isn't it? It's decided it will put money into metropolitan roads and not rail. Why, why is that? That's, that's just an Abbott government decision, is it? There's nothing in any sort of constitutional rules that would say invest in one but not the other. Uh, you're correct. But of course no government ever did invest in that area until Infrastructure Australia came along under Kevin Rudd and decided to include it. Uh, as a result we got the quite uh, questionable Gold Coast light rail in Queensland and very little else. We got an Eastern Busway that stopped at Kevin Rudd's electorate and got no further. So if anything I think people are now appreciating a focus on road infrastructure from the Infrastructure Prime Minister. So you, you would you'd be supportive of, of no uh, federal funds at all for public transport? I make the point that since Federation it hasn't been a federal responsibility uh, until, uh, you know, the brief tenure of Kevin Rudd until he ran out of money. So it was just a number no. of, a matter of three years under Kevin Rudd and that was it as far as rail, metro rail and federal support. But I'm happy to be corrected by Deborah if she can tell me the federal government that was investing in metro rail. Look, I think that there's a lot has changed since Federation and um, one of the things that's changed is Australia's expectations about what the federal government needs to support, particularly in terms of major infrastructure. And this carve out of public transport by this Prime Minister is uh, suiting his political purpose but certainly not suiting the national interest. Um, yesterday I saw a, a most engaging conversation uh, with Peter Van Olsen and um, Jeff Gallup uh, and uh, I think uh, John Hewson who were speaking very very succinctly and carefully about the power of Infrastructure Australia to help us articulate and carry through a number of governments of whatever persuasion a proper, careful, dedicated plan in the national interest around infrastructure. You know, I'm proud okay, that it was I established under Labor. I do have, to, I do have to cut you off there. I'm sorry, Deborah O'Neill, we're right out of time. Thank you for your time. Thank Pleasure. you as well, Andrew Lamming. Thanks for watching and stay with us for Newsday. We all 